mean to you? How do you define woke? There's a lot of things. I mean, you want to start with biological boys playing in girls' sports. That's one thing. The fact that we have gender pronoun classes in the military now. I mean, all of these things that are pushing what a small minority want on the majority of Americans, it's too much. That is Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley explaining her definition of the term woke. Culture wars are at the forefront of our nation's politics. The far right is looking to eliminate things like diversity programs in the workplace, while Democrats are seeking to enhance protections for minority groups. And our next guest writes the rigid focus on group identity that now dominates much of the public debate makes it harder for people from different groups to get along. Joining us now, founder of the magazine Persuasion and the host of the podcast, The Good Fight, Yasha Monk. He's a contributing editor at The Atlantic and a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. And his new book is entitled The Identity Trap, a story of ideas and power in our time. And Yasha, in your latest essay for The New York Times, based on the book entitled how to argue against identity politics without turning into a reactionary, you write in part this. Key members of what's been called the intellectual dark web started out opposing the real excesses of supposedly progressive ideas and practices only to morph into cranks. These dynamics have left a lot of Americans deeply torn. On one hand, they have serious concerns regarding the new ideas and norms about race, gender, and sexual orientation. They believe that practices like separating people into different groups according to race are deeply counterproductive. On the other hand, these Americans are deeply conscious that real injustices against minority groups persist. Mr. Trump and others on the right deride the new norms as woke. I prefer a more neutral phrase, which emphasizes that this ideology focuses on the role that groups play in society, the identity synthesis. The identity synthesis is a trap. If we collectively fall into it, there will be more, not less, zero-sum competition between different groups. But it is possible to oppose the identity trap without becoming a reactionary. It is time to fight without shame or hesitation for a future in which what we have in common truly comes to be more important than what divides us. And Yasha, thank you so much for being here. We've read <laughs> your entire book. No. And we thank you. Uh, now it's, it's uh, complicated. You know, it, it's, you know it's, it's really, it's a question I've been asking uh, for a very long time. It, it just it's sort of struggling with it myself. But like, there has to be this center ground between I, hardcore identity politics that separates us all into different groups and I would say fascism, but but let's let's just say reactionary, sort of this reactionary thing, where you have people on the far right basically saying we don't want to talk about, you know, uh, any parts of Black history or American history that make us uncomfortable. I, I think that's right, and there is such a tradition in American politics. In my mind, it goes from people like. Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln to Martin Luther King Jr. to, to Barack Obama. And I think the, the thing to understand about these terms of woke or critical race view that have been debated so much is that they've been much misunderstood by everybody in the debate. So on the right, people say, you know, you want to teach kids about the history of slavery in school or you want them to have sex ed. That's woke uh, or that's critical race theory. And that's, that's obviously absurd. But a lot of people, uh, my friends and colleagues, will then think, well, all that woke is is just being nice to people, is uh, recognizing the real injustices of American history or, or being afraid of somebody like Donald Trump coming back into the White House in, in 2024. When you actually look at some of the origin of these ideas and the way that they're being applied in all kinds of settings today, from nonprofits to corporations to, to schools, as, as I do in my new book, The Identity Trap, I think you find that these ideas go, go well beyond that, that they're actually based on an explicit rejection of that political tradition that, that I most prize in American politics, that the key theorists of critical race theory, for example, have uh, argued that we should reject the uh, defunct racial equality ideology 
of the civil rights movement, as Derek Bell once put it, or that the philosophy of Barack Obama is fundamentally at odds with the key tenets of this ideology, as somebody like Kimberly Crenshaw put it. Let me ask this. What about the danger of people being seen as a monolith, that if you're black or if you're Latino or if you're Jewish or if you're a woman, you all think alike? Yeah. And uh, we all have some common experiences, but we respond to them differently. Clarence Thomas and I are the same, but he's my color, he's not my kind. So, I mean, but we could be in the same circumstance of discrimination. How does your book and how does your view deal with how you deal with this monolith that everybody's put in a certain kind of category and, and that everybody therefore should think the same way when we don't? I, I agree with you 100% about that. So, so, so my argument is that uh, this particular new ideology, which is really interesting and insightful in some ways, but ultimately I think wrong-headed, is, is a political trap. It's actually going to make it easier for people like Trump to be re-elected. Um, it has all kinds of negative political consequences. But it's also a personal trap. Because a lot of schools close to where we are sitting in New York right now, they say, you know, the main goal of a progressive education should now be to uh, teach students to think of themselves primarily as racial beings. That to truly get the sense of belonging in society, they need to primarily think of themselves in terms of a particular intersection of identities into which they're born. Now, obviously, to belong in society, you can't have racism, you can't have discrimination, you can't say you're less than because of the group you're born in. But I think that falls in exactly the trap you're talking about, because to feel seen in society, I need to be recognized for my own preferences and ideas and character. My, my, my brother might have many similar identities to me, but I'm not my brother. I'm not going to be seen in the world if everybody perceives right. me as exactly the same as my brother, right? Um, and so I think precisely we need respect for different groups. It's wonderful that in America we celebrate people's different cultural origins. Solidarity between people who have historically been oppressed is wonderful. But if you have an education that says you should see yourself as a racial being, the most important thing about you is the particular group into which you're born. That's how you define yourself. Then we fall exactly into, into that trap. You know, I think what's so interesting here, listening to your argument and reading your work in The Times as well, is I think most people, actually most human beings, want to be judged by their character as an individual. So that's not really where the argument is. The thing that I'm having trouble understanding about, about your work and your argument is that identity politics isn't new. So if you are so genuinely and, and deeply concerned, understandably, about those kind of divisions that may be, in some cases, artificial, why not start with dismantling white supremacy where those divisions began right. and the power lies? So, so a few things. I mean, the first is that, uh, as you know, a lot of my work has been about that, right? Uh, this is my fifth book. The last two books have been about the threat of right-wing populism. I was one, uh, I like to say I'm a democracy crisis hipster. I worried about the crisis of democracy before was cool. I was warning about right-wing populists like Donald Trump, but also like people like Marine Le Pen in France and people like Narendra Modi in India. Um, uh, before 2016. So I agree with you that that is urgent and we have to fight against it. Now, purely politically, I actually think that uh, one of the reasons why these ideas have become so prevalent in progressive spaces is that Donald Trump won in 2016 and it became impossible to criticize some bad ideas on our own side as a result. But one of the reasons why Trump is now doing very well in the polls is that people mistrust these institutions because of the prevalence of some of these ideas. So we saw in a recent New York Times analysis that, that one key new voting bloc in the Republican Party is voters who are predominantly non-white, um, who are actually progressive on many issues, including acceptance of trans people and other kinds of things, um, uh, uh, but who are uh, being pushed away from the Democratic Party by, by some of these ideas. Now, to the broader question about identity politics, yes, I, I don't like the term identity politics. I avoid it because it's too many things at the same time. Um, certain forms of identity politics are perfectly legitimate if you're fighting against injustices um, that apply to you because of a group of which you are a part that is a normal part of politics and a laudable part of politics. But when you see, for example, uh, aid for small businesses uh, during the pandemic, going not to those businesses that have lost the most revenue, but rather to businesses depending <coughs> on the skin color of the people who own those businesses. Um, I think that that is failing the economic purpose of those policies, which is to help businesses survive during the pandemic that have most been affected by them. 
And I think it's setting up that kind of zero-sum politics where we're turning American politics into just an outright fight between groups, and there's no reason to think that in a systematic way those groups that have been historically most marginalized are going to be ones who win that fight. I think it's setting us up for failure in terms of actually helping those groups, and it is helping drive people to those dangerous white supremacists and far-right populists that, like you, I'm really worried about.